It's time for the No Nonsense Roundtable. Insights to capture your imagination from people you know and people you'd like to know about. Each week, a different guest from a different walk of life. Now, here is the host of the No Nonsense Roundtable, Dom Genova. Well, welcome everybody to the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm here with Dr. Ogilvy of the Rochester Institute of Technology School of Business, a Saunders School of Business. Somebody that uh, I've gotten to know over the past few months. We, uh, frankly, were at a uh, at a luncheon one day, and we started talking to one another. And you know, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a professor at RIT. Well, geez, that's pretty good. We are the Scott Saunders School of Business. Well, you know, Phil Saunders has been on the show a couple of times, and and uh, Dr. Munson, and uh, you know, what do you do? Oh, I do business, and oh, you're an entrepreneur. Yes, I'm an entrepreneur. And we start talking about well, just life and creativity, and and not only were we getting along, but we we're starting to complete each other's sentences, which is really kind of cool. You kind of connect it with somebody because mm-hmm. she has a, a wonderful depth of knowledge in, uh, in academics as a doctor, obviously. And I'm somebody who uh, couldn't even get into the <laughs> Rochester <laughs> Institute of Technology because uh, they they rejected my application, but I was going to be an engineer and I wasn't qualified for that. And, you know, the rest is history. We're here. We're here now uh, to talk about uh, her, her philosophy, her um, her teaching style, her students, uh, the uh, path that she's taken in life, and uh, and welcome to uh, my studio. It's great to see you. It's great to be here now. So uh, let's talk about your path in life. I, I, mm-hmm. I always see people on the show, this is a 200 and something show, that have had straight paths in life, and some people have kind of pivoted and and, and got where they are. So what was your, what was your path? You know, just mm-hmm. the, the 90-second uh, eyewash yeah. on that. So I grew up in Harlem, New York. Ah, okay. Um, a two-parent household. Uh, went to school. I was a very voracious reader. I got that from both my father and my mother. Both of them were voracious readers, and so are my, my siblings. Um, had a very different, you know, I was very shy. Really? Painf- painfully so. And, um, you know, I was just always with a book. And, you know, thought about different careers. Uh, went to college. Came out not really knowing um, exactly what to do. Got a job in photography. I'd been in for doing photography at college. Ended up um, working for a couple of small organizations, one as a COO to help them turn around, and then a CEO of another one that needed turning around. And got into big corporate, which was the Southland Corporation. Oh, okay. Ran multi-million dollar profit centers, and then got recruited down to corporate headquarters um, to do strategic planning because it was a fly by the seat of your pants company. And so I introduced strategic planning. First I did information systems planning then strategic planning and then went on a trip to Africa, uh, Kenya. And that changed what I wanted to do. Really? And that's How? what got me into now doing more, making a difference. Now, now what college did you go to? I went to Oberlin. Okay. And then I went to SMU. Okay. And then I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Is that where you got your PhD? Yes, at UT Austin. So that I mean that's that, that, I mean that's quite a lot of quite a lot of work, I mean, <laughs> obviously. But but how did this uh, trip to Kenya uh, change uh, your direction? It was my first time, well, not my first time in a black country because I had been to Jamaica. Um I'm half Jamaican. But it, I, it did something to me in terms of making a difference in a different way and making a difference in a larger way. You know, I made some difference when I was in corporate. Some of the things I introduced are still mm-hmm. going on today. Um, but Kenya just made me decide to become an academic. So what in Kenya did you see that you hadn't seen before? Well, um, people running things, safar- going on safari. Oh, it was just a, an experience, the beauty of the country. It just did something, and and and, and but, but but specifically, <laughs> in which which direction did it make you? It, it, it sounded like it made you have a a cause or a, an adventure. Maybe some sort of epiphany. I had been when I was in. Ah, my, that's my, what I want to hear. When I was in my uh, MBA program, my professor said you should get a PhD, which I basically ignored because I was running, you know, this area, and then they. Um, when my company had a, a year-long training program for marketing for senior execs, and mm-hmm. they said to me, oh, you should get a Ph.D. And I hadn't thought about it. 
But then my company did an LBO, leveraged buyout. Okay. Where the executives take big loans to uh, buy the company. Uh-huh. And I was not involved in it, although I was one of the very few, if any mm-hmm. others were, who knew what was going on. Because Not because I was told by the executives, mm-hmm. but another way I found out. Um, and I realized, and then they came to me and said, you know, you need to, we need to get to here. Mm-hmm. Um, a big, it was a big jump because the price at which the LBO was executed was, should, was much higher than it should have been. Mm-hmm. If we had stock, which we did, we made money, mm-hmm. but it was a big nut to crack. And when I tried to suggest different things we should do, they just wanted to do what they'd always done, but do it better. So you got dissatisfied with the big company. Yeah. yeah. Well, I knew that they weren't going to succeed with just do what yeah. we've always done. Well, that's one of the things that you and, and I then, have in common. Mm-hmm. You know, we've worked for big companies. And, mm-hmm. you, you know, we were talking about that. Uh, everybody should know that uh, it, uh, 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 DT was very uh, gracious uh, the other day and let me come in and, and speak with your class. Yes. And you, you seem to have a feeling about academics and uh, the same thing I do. You know, I have an MBA in marketing, mm-hmm. but you know, you can, there's, there are things that you learn in the classroom and mm-hmm. the things that you learn outside the right. classroom and the things that you can only learn in the classroom right. and the things you can only learn outside the classroom. Right. And you seem to have a pretty good a pretty good way of, of uh, teaching your, your students that way. It seems yeah. to be your philosophy, right? Well, you know, having experience and having run something, which most of my peers haven't done. Right. Um, when I was in corporate, you know, gave and running these, you know, smaller organizations. So it gave me a different type of experience and a knowledge of what students needed to know and what students needed to do and trying to impart that to them in a way that made sense. Mm-hmm. And so I loved having you at my class so you could talk about your experiences and impart some wisdom to the students. Well, I have to tell you, I was actually a little nervous. <laughs> to, I mean, the, I mean, these are 35, 35 students, and these, mm-hmm. I mean, they're all smarter than I am. I mean, there's no, well, there's no, no well, there, well, there's no question about it. They're all smarter than I am. I, I, I have more money than they do, <laughs> but they're, but they're smarter than I am. And you're wondering what, whether you're connecting with them or not. And uh, it, it, it was very rewarding for, for me to be there. The thing that you said is, abso- is absolutely true, though. You know, these people, a lot of people in academics are teaching something and they've never been involved in it. And it's the perception of what reality is, but it's not really what reality right. is. So there's no substitution for for experience. Mm-hmm. You need uh, academics, but you also need the practical application of whatever you're talking about. And I, and I put it this way, you know, I, I, I'm talking too much myself right now, but you you, you need an engine and a transmission. Yeah. You need the academics to, to mm-hmm. teach you, but you also need a way of taking what you learn in the classroom right. and, and applying it in a practical manner, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And RIT is known for uh, having students who can apply the- practice the theory. They can take what they're learning as opposed to some other schools where they're more theoretical. Right. And then they have to, you know, get out there and learn about the realities. Right. And it, and that uh, uh, that's a quality that I, I'm sure the students all uh, appreciate in what you do. And one of the things that you, you well, you've written, a, written a, a number of different books, right? I've written one book. Oh, one book. Okay, it's one book. And the book is on creativity. And yes. we're going to talk about that when we come back from the break because... Anybody who knows uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of mm-hmm. Needs, and if you haven't seen or you uh, haven't read Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, you really need to you really need to do it. Just Google it. And uh, on top of the list now, it used to be self actualization, and now it's you say creativity, creativity yeah, right? leaving yes. something behind that wasn't there before. Yeah. So, uh, right after the break, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, that concept, all told, and uh, we'll see you then. Well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. We're talking today to Dr. Ogilvy, who is a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology, the Saunders School of Business. And we were talking about uh, the practical application of, uh, of what she does and uh, what she teaches her students. And one thing I have to say is that you listeners pretty much are all over the age of 35, Mm. Uh, and older. We are uh, talking to people that are not in college. They have either students that might be going to college, uh, children or grandchildren. Mm. And what my objective is today is to interview DT about uh, uh, 
uh, about the RIT School of Business, but more importantly about her philosophy of teaching her students and what she thinks is important. And on top of the list we were talking about before is creativity, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. I think creativity is very important. A lot of people, though, feel they're not creative, and they live their lives as if they are not creative, which can create some problems for them mm-hmm. because they don't have the opportunity to get to that type of Maslow's hierarchy yeah. to self-actualize. You have to be willing to fail right? without viewing yourself as a failure. Failure, yep. You have to deal with ambiguity, mm-hmm. not just uncertainty. Those are two different things. And unfortunately, in our school system, we tend to leach the creativity out of kids so that by the time they're 11 or 12, a lot, they lose a lot of their creativity. And unless they're in doing something like music or art or something, but they don't necessarily think beyond that. Right. They use their creativity. Right. And, and, I, and I think, well, we were talking before the show mm-hmm. about the pressure that some, that some parents put on yes. their children mm-hmm. to, to succeed and, and without having a tolerance for failure. Right, right. Um, some parents are like, you have to get all A's, and if you get less than an A, that's terrible, and you get punished. Yeah. Um, you know... Parents love their kids. They want them to be successful. But oftentimes what they do, I find, is that they impose themselves on their kids and they don't allow their kids to flourish Mm -hmm. and be themselves. Um, Parents should not be trying to live their lives through their children. Right. Because they really do their kids a disservice. And parents, I I was with um, some educators and a woman who was an educator was talking about she couldn't go somewhere because she has to read a book to help her kid with to write their essay. Mm-hmm. And actually, she was going to write it, it sounded like. And I was appalled. We, you know, parents should not be doing their students' work for them, their kids' work for them. The kids have to learn how to do work on their own. They have to learn how to succeed on their own. And if they have to spend extra time, then spend extra time. But... They shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be put in this position because all you're doing is emasculating. And I'm not saying that in terms of gender, but they're robbing their children. They're hurting yeah. them and they don't realize it. That's why, you know, the anxiety levels today among kids is huge. Right. It's off the charts. And I think the parents unknowingly are contributing to that. Well, there's a couple of stories that I could I can contribute here mm-hmm. myself because uh, uh, my daughter, one of mm-hmm. my daughters, went to a college. She was exceedingly unhappy, mm-hmm. exceedingly mm-hmm. unhappy. And Nita and I said to her, okay, you have to dig yourself out of this. You find the path. Mm-hmm. You dig your way out of this. We'll, we'll help you. We're not going to pick you up and say, listen, you've got to come home and whatever. You dig yourself. So she <laughs> she uh, went, I, I won't tell you who it is, you know, which one of my, my children, but went to a, a different college, mm-hmm. found out what she needed to do, uh, made the application, got the uh, got a scholarship, uh, mm-hmm. transferred herself, and... Um, and ended up very well because she dug herself mm-hmm. out herself. Yes. Right. And she had a life skill right. that she wouldn't have before. And she also learned something in the process about herself. Right. And gained a confidence in herself that she would otherwise not have gotten if you had done it for her. Right. And that's the thing. They have to learn how to fail. You, you know, the funny thing is, is that I look back in my life. And, uh, you know, I was one of these kids that, you know, I was bullied all the time Mm -hmm. and I couldn't do anything in in the gym class and making fun of me or whatever. You know, I I learned to live with humiliation. You know, Mm. it's like, okay, fine. You know, whatever. You know, it's it's okay. You kind of, you know, kind of toughened up a little bit, you know, with that. And and it was, and believe it or not, I think I look back at it like, you know, it was, it was a life skill. It wasn't that bad of a deal. Yeah. You know, but if you have somebody you know who belittles you in your in your immediate family, and who kind of robs you of that mm-hmm. ability to learn how to deal with things, then your rest of your life you can't deal with it because it's too late. Now, some people say that uh, about twenty or thirty years ago, we made a mistake saying that our children didn't have good enough self-esteem mm. so we started rewarding them yes. for things oh. that they didn't do right is and that i mean is, yes. do you subscribe uh, oh to that? no you know here's i mean little, i mean you here's little johnny and little mary they're playing baseball they can't hit the ball they can't run and they get a trophy instead of saying look johnny if you want to play baseball you got to learn how to hit the ball so let's practice let me right. help you to, let me help you to right. learn how to hit the ball or let me help you to learn how to run or whatever but if you just get a trophy for doing nothing 
that just screws up your head. Well, I, you know, I like to tell the story. I think I might have told it yesterday uh, at the, uh, at my lecture. It's that I had somebody that applied to be the sales manager at my dealership, mm-hmm. and he never sold a car before. He was never in the car business before. And I'm saying, well, what do you, what qualifications do you have to manage the sales floor of 10 people? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, I, you know, I went to school and I got a degree and I have it, you know, it's like, okay, nobody ever told this young yes. fella, no, right. that's not the way right. that the world yeah. works. No, it's not. You know, you said something about your daughter, which I think is important. I don't know if anybody has read Malcolm Gladwell, Mm -hmm. um, who's a terrific author. He wrote a book called um, David and Goliath. And in the book, he talks about a young woman who did exceedingly well in high school and so well that she had offers from a bunch of different schools, including some Ivies. And of course, everybody told her to go to the Ivy. The, The local college or in the state, which was one of the top colleges in the country, also made her offer, but she went to the Ivy. She was so unhappy. Mm-hmm. She lost her self-esteem. She lost her self-confidence. Oh, yeah. She didn't do as well because that was not the right place for her. That's Had exactly right. Had she gone to the other school, she would have been the big fish in the pond as opposed to the minnow in the big school. No, the, I, I, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth to that, you know? So... I, I guess it's, it's kind of fun. When I when I was selling cars, I said, you know, cars are like shoes. They have to be affordable, a style you like, uh, comfortable, and you can't return them. You know, <laughs> yeah, so so when you're picking a college, mm-hmm. I think that's probably a pretty good lesson for us to, to say to, to people here right. listening on the on the show is that your your child should be fit into the college right. that's right for them right. too, right? Right. And if they're unhappy, they should be able to be able to change that situation. Right. Go to another, I, I have a couple of PhD students who were in that same boat. They were not happy. Yeah. And, they were and, not doing well. And then I put them, you know, brought them to Rutgers when I was at Rutgers. And now they're thriving. Right. And fitting the child to the to the school, I think, has got to be very important because, I, you know, I had a college counselor on the show one day and I said, you know, all these schools with all these amenities and mm-hmm. stuff and whatever. And she says, well, they're used to that at, you know, at, at school, you know, they're at home and whatever. And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, I used to make grilled cheese sandwiches with my iron. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, times have changed mm-hmm. since then. But right. but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of college is is so big and mm. uh, is so large. And, uh, you know, it becomes such a burden for people and oh, the yeah. other thing that i talk about i, I talked to um to phil saunders about mm-hmm. this was on the show having a marketable skill yes yes students need they need to have a marketable skill they need to know how to sell themselves mm-hmm. how to do the interview how to negotiate their salary but they need something that you know they can do right and you need to understand <laughs> that you may not get to the destination that you're looking for, but you should put yourself in a direction. And we can talk right. a little bit more about that uh, uh, after the break okay. now. But I, I think that's another I- important thing because, you know, everybody, you say, well, you have to go to college. You know, if you go to college and you get a degree in Russian history, well, mm-hmm. then, you know, as far as getting employment. Uh, well, we should talk about you know. entrepreneurship after the break. Yes, well, we'll talk about that. And, uh, well, it's about time for a break. Well, welcome back to the No Nonsense Roundtable. We're talking to Dr. D.T. Ogilvy, and you spell your you spell your first name with a a, a small D and a small T. Yeah, what, my, what, actually, what, I spell both my first and last name in lowercase small, letters. And why and why is that? I mean, that sounds very creative. We're yeah. about to talk about creativity, but why do you, <laughs> but why do, you do that? Well, when I got a copy of my birth certificate to get my um, license, uh-huh. anyway, on my birth certificate, my name is in lowercase letters. Okay, and you just decided to keep that. So I kept it. So I figured kept that's it. my legal name. Yeah, it's 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 nice though. It, it, yeah. it sets you apart from everybody else, and then it shows your creativity, which we're about to there talk you go. about. But we were um, we were talking about going to college and uh, and having a, a marketable right. skill, mm-hmm. and you, I, I guess you could turn anything into a marketable skill. But yeah, you know, everybody everybody doesn't want to go to business school. And work for, everybody doesn't work, want to work for a big company, but most people, unless they're wealthy, are going to have to work. Right. And so my philosophy is if you want to be an artist, you don't have to be a starving artist, but you have to think creatively about what your career can be. Right. And for some people, it's being an entrepreneur, selling their skills to somebody else who needs it or wants it. Mm-hmm. And I think if people, so therefore I would advise students I would advise all students. I would advise to take some entrepreneurship courses. 
Right. Take some business courses. Well, that makes sense because you can take something that you love and you mm -hmm. can turn it into something yes. that makes money for you. You know, I had uh, Jeff Tysak on the on the show a few mm -hmm. weeks ago and we were talking about um, his philosophy of teaching students. And mm -hmm. he was saying that uh, there are two philosophies. One is um, Warren Buffett and he says, do what you love. Mm -hmm. And Mark Cuban says, uh, do what you're good at. And he says, I'm more in the, the do what you love mm -hmm. sort of thing well hopefully I, the two are the same yeah uh, but 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 here's the, here's the, here's the thing you know i he was talking about his daughter wanted to sing uh, opera mm. at the met ah. and and carmen right. of all things <laughs> he says well she didn't get there but she right. did something different well, she's mm -hmm. managing those people now and we were talking about uh, the the concept of point yourself into a direction and mm -hmm. not necessarily a destination right. and it's sort of like i kind of articulated this you know like kind of be where you love mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you when you say that uh, yes. if you like the theater right. be in the theater yes, if you want to you know, if mm -hmm. you're you know, if you're a musician be where right. musicians right. are but you also said something to my students which i thought was very powerful and it was about your daughter mm -hmm. who's a photographer mm -hmm. and so she was doing a different type of photography even though she had a goal Right. To be in a certain um, She was doing, the, paper. Uh, for, for anybody that um, doesn't know, because I mentioned it bef before on another show, she was doing digital teching, right. which is assisting a photographer. Mm -hmm. So she would be on these photo shoots, these very, very big photo shoots. Mm -hmm. And one of them was BMW and whatever. And mm -hmm. she's behind the laptop. Right. And she's telling the photographer basically what to do and then mm -hmm. retouching the photographs mm -hmm. when they come back. Mm -hmm. So she's not doing what she wants to do, but it's a path right. to what she wants right. to do. And you've seen And her she's turned her skill into uh, a um, way to get remuneration in the area right. that she cares about. Right. And then eventually she was able to get her photo shoot in the Times, which I'm sure has opened some other doors for her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Once you have photographs in the Times, right. you can say, I have photographs in right. the Times. Exactly. So, and, and, and that that has to do with your reputation, mm -hmm. which yes. you know, my, my dad told me that years mm -hmm. ago. She says, you have one reputation when it's gone, it's gone. That's you know, true. He was, talking about, he was talking about ethics when mm -hmm. he was talking about that. But you have a reputation for uh, doing a certain job, let's yes. say. Yep. And so... As a student, if you think about it, yes, I want to be in Russian history. Okay, what can you do with, with that? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you write a book. Right. Or maybe you write articles. Uh, maybe you advise people who are interested in Russia. Mm -hmm. You give them, you know, you become a consultant. Right. But if you just think of, you know, I don't know what you would think of in Russian, you know, become a teacher. Well, you know, yeah, but that's not the only path. Right. So you have to think creatively about how you can use something that you love to be in that venue. Well, I, I, you know, I'll talk about my other daughter. Mm -hmm. So my other daughter graduated with a degree in English. Mm -hmm. And she says to me one day, oh, dad, you know, what am I going to do? I have a degree in English. I'm never going to be as successful as you. Well, OK. So she goes and she's um, interns at the attorney general's office mm. here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. She gets a great recommendation from mm -hmm. the attorney general's office. She goes to she goes to Notre Dame law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then she's you know, now, now she went through uh, a couple of clerkships with mm -hmm. the federal judges. And mm -hmm. she now she's working for the University of Notre Dame as a lawyer. Yeah. But she, I, I mean, she wasn't 12 years old and right. wanting to be a lawyer. Right, right. She had a skill, she, right. but the skill was the, the, the skill was useful. It exposed her. And right. through that exposure, she found something else that she liked. And, right. you know, and so that, that also happens. But one of the things I was told when I was in big corporate by one of my bosses, he said, do not develop a career path. Because what happens is you're going to miss opportunities. Because right. you're focused on, I have to get this position and then that position and so forth. Right. He said, you're going to miss stuff. And I listened. And every position I had after my initial position was something that didn't exist until I had it. Right. And so, um, I, you know, I try to tell my students, you know, don't focus on having a career path. But a take advantage of opportunities. Right. And a destination. And mm -hmm. one thing I, I also said to your students, uh, don't be afraid to go backward, to right. go forward. Yes, or sideways or whatever, right? Oh, my Lord. I mean, Nita and I sold everything we had. Mm -hmm. And we put the two girls in, 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 <laughs> and the cockatiel mm -hmm. <laughs> in a minivan, drove up here. But we had a 3,000 square foot house. We went to a 1,200 square foot house. I'm living on 40,000, not like 100,000. Mm -hmm. And we went backward to go forward. Yeah. Man, that happens. You know, you have to, you know, leave one school and go to another school. You have to leave one job, go to another job. You shouldn't 
feel that you have no opportunities or you can't change. So your teaching style seems to be the practical application of, I see you nodding your head, yes. you know, the pra- practical application of what you learn in the classroom. Right. And also to, you know, tell students about, you know, what's it like to be working, mm-hmm. you know, things you need to know if you're going to be working. And right. So that you don't have to do, you know, some things you can learn vicariously in the classroom. And then I give my students experiences. So my students right now um, have to interview three people in a company. I'm teaching organizational behavior and apply these organizational behavior concepts. Right. And see where the company may need help or what things they can change based on what they're learning and then give a report. Well, and they need the practical contact with people who have actually been in, yes. in, in business. Yes. Too. Right. So that gives them that. They're interviewing actual people in business. We bring in a speaker like yourself who's been in business or is in business, and we give them some exposure. Well, the other thing I see about this, too, is that um, my perception is that a lot of younger people are looking for 1.5 million TikTok followers, or, and, and they don't they don't see the I, I, I call them the hidden entrepreneurs, the mm-hmm. hidden successes, mm-hmm. the people that have done things in their right. lives that they just don't the people see. next door, right? Right, right. exactly. The, the millionaire next door, yeah. Per the book. Well, take a look at uh, like Malik Evans. Malik mm-hmm. Evans was an executive for for ESNL, mm-hmm. right? And now he's the mayor of Rochester. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I I'll guarantee you, he didn't say when he was ten years old he wanted to be mayor of Rochester. Probably not, right? No. But he pivoted. Yes. Um, the other thing in my classes when I teach entrepreneurship, my students have to start a business. Uh huh. Not just a um, uh, simulation. But an actual business. Oh, really? Right. And I give them a budget, $10. Oh, and, and uh, what what has been the most successful one so far? They made She made about $1,500 in one semester. Oh, really? Doing what? She was selling food okay. from her, her country. And she set up um, a bunch of customers who wanted a nice lunch that she would provide every week. <laughs> <laughs> Very creative. When I was in college, I was station manager of a radio station. Um, I got us an FCC license, which really, which, which was great experience for uh, for a young man that that, that age. But uh, I had to do a project just like that. It was a theoretical business, though. I started a radio station. Mm. I think I got a D, mm. <laughs> like Fred Smith, who started who started at FedEx, right? He, I think he got a C or a D in his. The other student who was successful was started. A, he had a nonprofit agency, uh-huh. um, so he did piano recitals and stuff like that and raised a lot of money for the uh, charity that he wanted to support. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. I, I, uh, uh, all my case studies, I, <laughs> I had this, I had this theory. I always put down, it was a problem in communication and uh, that uh, guaranteed me at least a C plus. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> my formula. Oh my Lord. So uh, we're going to uh, get back into another uh, break in a second here. And uh, we're going to see you at the other end. Well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Jennifer, your host, every Saturday right here on News Radio Wham 1180. And we're talking to Dr. D.T. Ogilvy, who is a professor of uh, business at uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology. And let me pass something by you. Mm-hmm. I was talking to a young man one day. I want you to comment on okay. this. And I said to him, I says, well, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Mm-hmm. He, and he says to me, I want to be an entrepreneur or an accountant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you comment on that? I would say that the young man is, it sounds like he's been told he should be one or the other, but he hasn't really thought about it because being an entrepreneur or an accountant are two different things. Right. And an entrepreneur really is not a job description. No. That, at least not to me. It's a career. Right. But it's not a job description because it, depending on the nature of the business, what business where and so forth, you know, it's going to be different. So there's no one thing that's an entrepreneur. And the most important thing you, you teach your students about being a entrepreneur is? Is not being afraid of failure. Well, I can tell. So I talked about students starting a business. So I can tell who has the ability to be an entrepreneur versus who doesn't, because here's what happens. We have two students. We have Dom and DT. So... Dom, you know, says, oh, I'm going to have this business, starts trying to do this business, and he fails. And what does he do? He gives up. DT starts a business. It's not working, so she tries something else. It doesn't work at all. She tries something completely different, but she keeps trying until she finds something that works. 
that's the student who can be an entrepreneur because being an entrepreneur is not in, in a panacea for yeah. riches. It's a work. It's a career, but it takes work. It takes the ability to fail and learn from failure. And, and I would even define failure as the succession of creativity as a succession from a series of failures. Mm -hmm. So you fail, you try something different. You fail, you try something right. different until you hit on what works. You see, this is where we, we were finishing each other's senses. <laughs> now, did you ever see the movie uh, Tucker? Yes. Okay. Yes. The so at the end wiper. of it, he's he's bankrupt. The thing mm -hmm. has gone right down the the the, the tubes. Mm -hmm. He is he's in in the car and he's looking. And some he's drawing a a picture of a, of a bottle mm -hmm. uh, so you can keep a, like a quart of milk cold in yeah. in a hot climate. He's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is oh, okay. This didn't work out. I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you gotta be. Yeah. You yeah. Can, you can't get you can't get down. No. You right. have, yeah. If you understand and don't get discouraged by failure, there's no limit to what you can do. If you want to talk about limitlessness then that's mm -hmm. the ability to understand that a failure is just a learning. You know, think of, you know, we think of Edison. Right. So, and actually we talk about this in the book. So Edison tried different things and he couldn't find a filament. Well, what he did was he brought in somebody to help him. Right. And it wasn't just Edison by himself, but it's like when you're being creative, it's what resources do you need? Mm -hmm. Go around the mountain, through the mountain, blow the mountain right. up. Sometimes, and yeah. part of it is usually most creative people need to be part of a team of people because they have different types of creativity. Mm -hmm. So Louis Latimer was the person that Edison needed to help him to bring the filament to fruition. Mm -hmm. And now we have light bulbs. If it weren't for Louis Latimer, who knows what right. would have happened. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that we try to protect our children Mm -hmm. from failure right. seems to be an impediment to yes. their very success is yes, what you're saying. Yes, it is. It is. It's a, if your baby's learning to walk, every time they fall, do you, you know, pick them up and don't let them walk again? Mm -hmm. Or you tell them, oh, bad, you're a bad baby, you fell? No. Right. The baby has to fall in order to learn to walk. Right. And students, it's through failure you learn. So right. kids learn through failure. And if you don't make a big deal out of it, or you just laugh at, oh, you know, you, you fell, okay. Then that student learns resilience. That right. kid learns resilience. They, the kid learns self-confidence. That kid learns that they can learn. Right. And those things make a difference. Right. I, I, I enjoy talking to your class so much yesterday. Yeah, they Be enjoyed you. Well, I, I, like I said, it was, I, I was actually a little nervous talking to them. I'm in a, in a classroom of 35 people who are, who are much smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. But... But, you know, the, the life lessons that you learn and the idea that you try to bring in practical knowledge for them mm -hmm. that is something that's not academics, is, right. is experiences from people who have actually been in the hunt, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think is very valuable. Oh, and, yeah. and, and that's not, like, like you said, that's not every, every university or college that yeah. does that. And I used to, um, when I was at Rutgers, I uh, created a doing business in another country course and took students to other countries, and it was extremely valuable for them because they saw something that wasn't in the U.S. They right. got a better appreciation for what other countries are and better appreciation for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing that students need because anything that opens up your mind, opens up your ability to think, right. is, gives you a skill and gives you something that's important for your success that other people don't have. Right. And so the more you can do that, the, and the more we can think about that, you know, of getting our kids exposure uh, to other people, to other countries, that's helpful. Oh, yeah. If we're all the same and think the same and are the same, then progress is not going to be made. Well, I think that's pro probably one of the problems in our country all told. I mean, even mm -hmm. when we go look at the news, where do we go? We go with the news right. where we think the news is most right. like what we want to hear. Right. right, exactly. And, you know, what... You know, they say that you shouldn't have people around you who, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. But there's a danger. Yeah, it's comfortable. Right. But if you're going to really learn more, you have to be with birds who are different. Right. And when you, you have this network that's right. um, not a strong network, but a weak network, that is the most valuable network you can have because there are people who are different from you. They have different skills, different knowledge, right. different abilities. Right. You can learn from them. You, they can buttress what you need to do if you need to accomplish something. You know, if Edison hadn't met in Latinum, who was not in his social circle and, you know, with his friends, then 
Just think about that. Maybe we'd be sitting here with torches instead of light bulbs. Right. I, I have this personal philosophy. Maybe it's a little bit corny. I think creation is still going on. Yes. You know, my, my personal my mm-hmm. personal philosophy, theology, philosophy, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, is that I think that you have to participate the best you can mm-hmm. to make the place a little bit better yes. than mm-hmm. it had been before. Right. And, and it seems like around, you subscribe to that, too. Yeah. Everything around us is invented by somebody or created by somebody. Sure. Um, and there are more things that we'll see um, people will be creating. But what we don't wow. want is I, I was talking to a student the other day. Well, I think he was in the master's program and he had ideas like 10 years ago that he great idea. He did nothing with it. And that's not unusual. People, there are people who are idea people. They're different. That's why we talk in our book, creativities, not creativity, because they are different types of creativity. People have creativity that operates on different levels of the value chain. So if I'm an idea person, that's great. But then I need you because you're a person who can take an idea and do something with it and be creative in the process of bringing it to fruition. So I love talking to people like you because at the end of the day, somebody's a little better off for what you're doing other than, you know, I mean, there's some people that go to work and you mm-hmm. you, you do a job to just to get the money, which right. is perfectly okay. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you have affected a, a student, a mm-hmm. young person, and you never know how that's going to affect them uh, years right. from now. Yep. And, and you have to have some students that probably contact you years oh, after yeah. you've taught them. I have and, um, a student just um, t- LinkedIn texted me. Um, yesterday, uh-huh. and he was my he was in my first class in '94 when I taught at Rutgers. Okay, and we're still in touch. In fact, he in invited touch. me to his wedding. Yeah. Um, another student is the CEO of Siemens. Wow, in Greece, and he um, yeah sent me a memo about something I taught in my yeah. class that he thought was very powerful and helped him to, in his career. Yeah. You know, I, I, I say this all the time. It's, it's, it's too bad we're on the radio because I look at the smile <laughs> on your face and the joy that's giving you. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's genuine. And uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Oh, and this was uh, wonderful. We're going to have to do this again. I would love to. I would love to do this again. You know what? Why don't we think about doing this with one or two of you students? That would be nice. That would be nice. Yeah. I yeah. will see if they're interested. I Think one I'm or sure two I think yeah. I think I know which ones would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, DT, I I really do appreciate you coming in. You've been well, thank been you. a good friend, and uh, I'm glad to know you. I'm glad we were able to get together at that uh, at that lunch at one time. Yes. We're gonna have to. It was, you know, it was thank fate. our friend, fate. <laughs> yes, fate. Well, everybody, well, we'll see you next week on the No Nonsense Roundtable. Well, thanks for watching this YouTube. If you liked it, please like and share.